Hey guys, in today's video, we'll be taking a look at the Buttar brothers from British Columbia, Canada. Bal, Manjeet, and Kelly have each played their role in the establishment of what has become the Indo-Canadian Mafia. We'll get into detail on how they climbed the ranks in the criminal underworld and even got involved with perhaps the most infamous Indo-Canadian gangster, Bindi Johal. Unfortunately, their early lives remain shrouded in mystery. All we know is that they were born and raised in Redmond, British Columbia. Of the three, Manjeet is the oldest, Bal is the second born, and Kelly is the youngest. From a young age, the three got into trouble in school and off the streets. They engaged in petty crimes involving violence, drugs, and theft. Their motivation for mischief was further fueled by racism in the 1980s to 1990s. The older they grew, the deeper they dove into Canada's underworld and started engaging in more serious crimes like kidnappings and extortion. They allegedly even established a gang under their name, the Buttar Gang. At a time when Canadian gangs were predominantly white, the Buttar Gang was said to be among the first Indo-Canadian gangs to hit the streets and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the local big names. According to a veteran Vancouver police officer, they ripped off other drug dealers and demanded they pay taxes if they wanted to sell drugs in their area. Even back then, despite Manjeet being the oldest, it was Bal Buttar that led the gang. According to the police officer, Bal was at the center of a lot of crime that was going on in the lower mainland area. Later in life, Bal Buttar gave a brief life's account of how life was back in his younger days. He was born on December 11, 1975. According to him, it was bullying and an underlying attention deficit disorder ADD, that lured him into the criminal life at such a young age. From his early school days, he suffered bullying from other kids who particularly teased and called him names because he wore a turban. The bullying got worse, and he eventually decided to counter it by getting tough and instilling fear in those around him. I learned how to give attention to people by giving them fear. And then with fear, they would listen to me. Whatever I would tell them to do, they would do. Ball told the Vancouver Sun. With his newfound realization, Ball grew even wilder. It started with fistfights, then knives, and it wasn't long before he found himself with a gun in hand. Eventually, he got the attention of the local authorities, who enrolled him in a youth detention and wilderness program. However, he slowly stopped attending. A few years later, in early 1997, Bal Buttar found himself in jail for one of his many crimes. It was behind the walls that he became acquainted with Bindi Johal and they struck up a friendship when they were cellmates. At the time, Bindi was among the top local names in Vancouver's crime scene. He took Bal into his growing empire and he eventually became Bindi's loyal lieutenant. Bindi had said to Bal, You're going to be the one underneath me. You listen to me. If you take care of things at your end, I'll be happy with you, my brother. If you fuck me over, I'll kill you. It was also Bindi that took Bal to the gym and introduced him to steroids. In less than two years, Bal was bigger and packed on more than 100 pounds. According to Bal, this further helped assert his presence to those around him. He was glad. With Bal and another associate named Roman Man at his side, Bindi's empire skyrocketed. Allegedly, it went from making $500,000 in its first year, to about $4 to $5 million a year, two years later. Ball was also generous in explaining how the empire operated. According to Ball, Mann was put in charge of a 15-man crew that dealt with drugs and brought in tens of thousands of dollars a month. On the other hand, Ball was the governor of another faction of 20 men that dealt with mafia-related businesses. They would organize and steal truckloads of lumber, computers, and other commodities and resell the products on the streets. Ball knew his trade well. He had contacts of several truck drivers that were willing to rip off their employers by claiming their load was stolen. According to Ball, they made 15 to 20,000 a load and would steal around three loads a month. It was also Ball's faction that dealt with luxury car theft. They would buy totaled luxury cars from the United States with the promise of crashing them. However, before destroying the vehicles, they would remove the ignition and vehicle registration number. He would then send out his men and have them steal a car of the same make and model. They would then change the ignition and registration number before flipping it at auctions. According to Ball, they would buy a totaled car at $2,000 and resell it for around $15,000 to $16,000. 
Finally, among the many branches of their business, Ball was also in charge of a murder for hire hit group that called itself the Elite Hit Squad. They charged around $15,000 to $20,000 per murder. After experiencing such success, Bindi, Ball, and Mann decided to name the empire the Indo Canadian Mafia. As the months went by, business was good, and the money was flowing. However, Ball started noticing that Bindi's behavior was getting more reckless by the day. He was slowly losing regard for those around him and portraying aggressive behavior. Nonetheless, it wasn't until the night of September 19, 1998, that things got out of hand. On that night, Ball, his brother Kelly, and their other friend, Derek Shankar, went out clubbing. As the night was getting better and the brothers were getting drunker, Shankar decided to call Joe Hall and convince him to attend the party. Bindi replied, I am tired, man. I don't want to go. Shankar was already drunk at this point and decided to tease Bindi a bit with the hopes of convincing him to join them. In the heat of the moment, he called Joe Hall an idiot and a baby. He even went ahead and swore at him for remaining at home. Joe Hall replied, watch your language. Don't say these things to me. Although everyone took this as banter to a friend, Joe Hall seemed to take it to heart. The party eventually came to an end at around 3 a.m., and the group went back home. Joe Hall was the first to welcome them back. However, instead of going inside, he asked where Shankar was. The young man was drunk and asleep in the truck. Joe Hall then ordered Ball to back in the truck for a drive. Joe Hall drove the truck and stopped under the Queensboro Bridge in New Westminster. At this point, Ball had already figured out what was about to happen and pleaded with Joe Hall not to harm Shankar. Joe Hall ignored his request and quickly woke up Shankar, suggesting they should go outside to relieve themselves. Ball was told to stay in the truck. For a while, there was silence until Ball had a gunshot. He quickly got out of the truck only to see Shankar's body falling to the ground. For a second, he thought about pulling out his gun and shooting Joe Hall. However, he knew it would be likely that he would suffer the same fate. Joe Hall was dangerous, after all, he was who trained all the five members of the elite hit squad. Ball stood in shock and didn't do anything. Joe Hall quickly called out to Ball and instructed him to help throw the body in the water. Upon their return, Ball shared the details with his brother Kelly who was enraged. Shankar was close to both Kelly and Ball. Kelly was also mad at Ball for not doing anything to help their friend. It was then that Ball swore to avenge Shankar. According to Ball, Shankar was a party animal. Nonetheless, he was a boy that never messed around when it came to work. He was legit and one of their best kids. Joe Hall wasn't done. Things got worse when he turned on Roman Mann. On November 29, 1998, he ordered his assassination because he wanted out of the criminal organization. It was now clear to Ball that Joe Hall would kill anyone that got on his wrong side. Although Joe Hall's temperament was feisty, Ball later revealed that he was one who did something that worsened the situation and potentially led to man's death. According to Ball, Joe Hall got acquainted with a Hells Angels member who invited him to their clubhouse in Vancouver. On that day, Joe Hall showed up with his lieutenants, Ball and Mann. However, they were rudely denied entry at the door. Ball, being drunk at the time, got angered by the situation and pulled out his gun and shot a few bullets in the air. He even threatened to shoot one of the Hells Angels in the leg. Surprisingly, Joe Hall was cool about the incident and directed his men to get back in the car and leave. News of the incident spread fast and was even featured in the news. The whole ordeal brought a lot of heat on Joe Hall and his group. It was the heat that convinced Mann it was time to leave. Mann eventually opened up to Joe Hall about his exit. Joe Hall was so mad that he punched him. According to Ball, just a few days later, Mann's body was found behind a warehouse. Joe Hall called Ball and suggested they attend the funeral and blame it on the Hells Angels. Suspiciously, right after the burial, Joe Hall suggested they go clubbing. It was at this point that Ball was convinced it was Joe Hall who murdered their associate, Roman Mann. Just a few days later, in December 1998, Joe Hall seemed to have decided it was time to get rid of Ball. There was news that Ball, together with other members, were unhappy with how Bindi ran the organization, and this didn't sit well with Bindi. On that fateful night, Joe Hall and Ball were driving to a nightclub when suddenly, Joe Hall took an illegal turn. 
Luckily for Ball, the police pulled them over because of the sudden turn. Johal pulled out a gun and ordered Ball to take the fall and admit the gun was his. Ball was shocked. He knew Johal never carried his gun without telling him. Without a doubt in Ball's mind, Johal had made up his mind to kill his loyal lieutenant. Ball agreed and pleaded guilty. For him, that was the opportunity to get rid of Johal for good. Ball knew that if he ordered for Johal's assassination while in prison, he'd have the perfect alibi. At the time, the elite hit squad distrusted Johal because of his recklessness. They now favored and listened to Ball as their leader. On December 20, 1998, while behind bars, Ball ordered for Johal's assassination and paid $20,000 for the job. According to Ball, it was the elite hit squad that got him at the Palladium nightclub. With Johal gone, Ball took over the empire and, peace, lasted until August 3, 2001. Gary Rye, Ball's close friend, suggested they go to a Vancouver salon and get their legs waxed. Ball loved to take care of himself and was known for his strong fashion sense. He agreed. Unknown to Ball, it was in that salon that his life would change forever. Ball was enjoying his time in the salon when suddenly, gunmen appeared and started firing at him. He suffered multiple bullets to his body and one to his brain. One of the police officers who responded to the 911 call reported seeing Ball's brains on the floor. Miraculously, despite the damage, Ball survived the attempt on his life. However, he was now a blind quadriplegic with slurred speech. He could only move his head from side to side. Thinking back, Ball believed it was his close friend, Rai, that planned the attempt on his life. Ironically, Rai lost his life on that dreadful day. Besides Rai, others involved in the assassination attempt were Ball's former associate Horaluk, Ball's girlfriend, and another mysterious individual called, The Teeth. Horaluk was found, dead, two weeks later. The authorities believe it was Ball's men that killed him to avenge their boss. Just four months later, on December 22, 2001, Ball received word that his brother Kelly Buttar was shot dead at a Richmond wedding. According to Ball, that was his life's darkest hour, his brother's body was brought to the same hospital he was being treated at. It was only several floors below him. The police officer responsible for guarding Ball in the hospital reported that Ball cried every morning after learning of his brother's murder. Ball later revealed that he strongly believed it was Robbie Candola that ordered his brother's assassination. According to Ball, Robbie killed Kelly because he thought Kelly was selling drugs on his turf. Despite his condition, Ball arranged for the murder of Robbie Candola on June 23, 2002. On that day, Robbie was mercilessly sprayed with bullets in broad daylight in front of his Coal Harbor apartment. Ball shared this information with the interviewer knowing the police would not imprison him because of his condition. After avenging his brother, Ball decided to quit the gangster life and turn his life around. He believed the fact that he survived the shooting was a second chance from God, to write a book, confessing everything he'd seen, with the hopes of discouraging young people from following in his footsteps. Ball told the Vancouver Sun, I never used to believe in God before. But once he gave me a second chance, I knew it was for a reason and that reason is to write a book. During his last days, he strongly talked about the dangers of being a gangster. He advised young people not to get involved with the underworld and resist its temptations of money and power. Many believed he had truly changed for the better. It didn't last long. In 2007, despite his bedridden condition, Ball attempted to plan a hit for an acquaintance who wanted her husband dead. Nonetheless, Ball came clean about it a few months later. Eventually, in 2011, Ball Buttar died after spending years in a long-term healthcare facility. According to those responsible for him, the big-time Vancouver gangster bent his last days in a wheelchair listening to TV shows all day long. He never got to complete his book. Of the three brothers, only Manjeet Buttar remains. The last we heard of him was back in 2016 when he pulled an interesting stunt. According to the police, they received a call from a complainant reporting a shooting disturbance. The police acted immediately and summoned all their forces, including the Lower Mainland District Police Dog Service, K-9. Upon arrival at the location, the police couldn't find any evidence of disturbance or that shots were fired. Instead, they were welcomed by a drunk and armed Manjeet Buttar. Immediately the police took charge and tried to de-escalate the dangerous situation. Manjeet didn't make it any easier for them. 
he adamantly refused to believe that the fully dressed police officers were legit. Nevertheless, at the end of it all, the police managed to arrest Manjeet and take him to trial. In the end, the court charged Manjeet for the possession of a firearm with an altered serial number, possession of a firearm contrary to a previous court order, and possession of a loaded restricted firearm. Only time will tell as to which direction his life is headed. The police suspect he is still actively involved in gangster activities in Vancouver. For now, he remains an executive member of Local 502 of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union ILWU. Local 502 is a branch of the ILWU that dispatches workers to the Delta Port, the largest container port in Canada. According to the police, the union offers lucrative jobs to its members. We're talking $39 an hour jobs that can pay up to $70 an hour for weekends and night shifts. However, they aren't offered to the general public. All jobs are only available to active longshore workers and recruitment only takes place once every few years. Usually, jobs are passed on as heirlooms from one family member to another. Manjeet, his father and brother Kelly have also worked as longshore workers in the past. Interestingly, in 2010, ILWU publicly credited Manjeet Bhuttar as one of its best members despite the police, in the same year, announcing Manjeet as one of Vancouver's most notorious gangsters. The accreditation further supported police suspicion that the organization is linked to many criminal organizations like the Hells Angels. The authorities are still investigating. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. Also, comment down below on what you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching, and have a good one.